أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولو شاء ربك لجعل الناس أمة واحدة ولا يزالون مختلفين إلا من رحم ربك ولذلك خلقهم A short glimpse into the Islamic world today one would realize the amount of hatred and animosity among nations, among its adherents. Unfortunately, the state of destructions, the state of war, civil, civil strives and civil conflicts in the form of a gruesome murders and terrorism is very ram rampant in the Islamic nations. One would think that maybe, that maybe this conflict has a sectarian motive. Sunnis versus Shia, Shia versus Sunnis. But the reality speak loud otherwise. Looking, for example, at the civil war in Libya, the problem of terrorism in Tunisia and in Morocco and in Egypt, the fight between Moroccan government and the Western Polisario, the terrorist organization in Nigeria known as Boko Haram, the barbaric actions of the ISIS, the Islamic State in different Islamic countries, the movement of youth in Somalia, Taliban in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines. Those are all in Sunni communities, whereas there is no Shia can be found in these areas. Beside the fact that these acts have been exacerbated and has been orchestrated by the world powers and with the help and participation of some regional governments and some Arab countries with the help of the petrodollars who have exacerbated the situation, and beside the fact that these also are the product of the extremist views of certain draconian type of sectarians and faith, such as Salafism and Wahhabism. Yet, these conflicts all have one hallmark. The pervasive common feature of all of those is that they all carry intolerance. They are having a very fertile ground for intolerance, bigotry, and prejudice. Intolerance against alternative views that no one beside the dominant view can exert and say their own views. This is unfortunate. You will see this problem throughout the Muslim nations. Everywhere you will go, unfortunately, you see this conflict. This all due to the intolerance, due to prejudice, due to certain group who believe rigidly in their belief while discrediting others completely. When you look at Quran, however, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many verses in the Holy Quran stress on diversity and pluralism and admonishes Muslim and command them to follow a harmonious and human way of dealing with each other. Despite the fact that each would respect others' views, yet they live in harmony among themselves. When you look at the Holy Quran, you see that there are two important points that the Holy Quran emphasizes. One is diversity. The variance in styles, variance 
in thoughts, in languages, in colors, just like the mother nature. Mother nature has big variety and diversity. The same thing could be said with the human thoughts and Quran come to endorse this fact. The second fact that Quran emphasizes on is unity and harmony among the citizens of the nations. Let's talk about the first subject, the first point. The first point Quran emphasizes on the fact that this nature, this life is full of diversity. There is dissimilarity among the creatures. Each creator has their own qualities. They have their own characters. Look at the nature where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ وَالدَّوَابِّ وَالْأَنْعَامِ مُخْتَلِفٌ أَلْوَانُهُ كَذَلِكَ إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء Look at different types of people, different types of living things, different types and varieties of animals with different colors, with different features. These are all creation of the Almighty. Why he would state it in the Holy Quran? So we can appreciate the diversity in nature. Also, the Almighty talks about the diversity in dialects, in languages, and in thoughts among its people, among the human being. For example, the ayah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ Just look at around you. Just look at the heavens and look at earth and look at the differences, the varieties in the language. اختلاف ألسنتكم Meaning different tongues. And here some scholars say that with the ayah means different languages. Some other scholars say language by itself is not that important. What is the importance in the, what is important in this ayah? It is different thoughts, different opinions, different world views. At the same way that you are different in colors, in physical features, also your thoughts are also different. In fact, in another verses in the Holy Quran, the Almighty stress on this fact, it is the default, the default of a human nature is diversity, plurality in thoughts. You cannot force people to be monolithic in thoughts. They have only one way to think, one way to behave. Where it says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَآمَنَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا لَآمَنَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كُلُّهُمْ جَمِيعًا If God had wished, He had made all people, everyone in the planet, to be faithful, to accept the message of you, Ya Rasulullah. أَفَأَنْتَ تُكْرِهُ النَّاسِ حَتَّى يَكُونُوا مُؤْمِنِينَ You, Muhammad, would force people to become believer if god has mandated thing has mandated th this thing and had wanted people to have faith in your religion he would have made them but the beauty is in diversity the beauty is that people are born to have a free thought they are born to be free free to choose free to live a free, a free in styles. You cannot impose your will upon them. In fact, when you look at Islam, you see that Islam has institutionalized for a civilization that tolerates and accepts diversity and a plurality in thought. When you look at the advent of Islam, you see at the time of our Imams, they were different groups of people who would take part in the classes of the Imams that they would teach them. 
among those groups, they were atheists, people who would not even believe in the Lord, would not believe in God, in the existence of God. And they had multiple and numerous discussions and debates with our Imams. In fact, those debates used to take place in the holy Masjid Al-Haram, in the most sacred place for Muslims. These debates between atheists and the Imams in the holy Kaaba. Imagine how much the society and community was tolerant to differing and alternative ideas. Quran and Islam never combat other ideas. Rather say, if you want to succeed and overcome, you better have a best argument. In fact, Quran endorses diversity. In another ayah, the one that I have recited at the beginning, it says that, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَجَعَلَ النَّاسَ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ If God had decided, He would make all people all unified, all monolithic in thoughts, in faith, and in opinion. But the fact is otherwise. They all have different alternative thoughts, and they will remain that way until the hereafter, until the time of the day of judgment. You, the Prophet, have no right to force them to have only a single ideology, a single faith. So the first fact that Quran emphasizes on is diversity in nature, diversity in thoughts and world views. The second fact, the second important point that Quran raises is unity among its citizens. The Almighty Allah at the same time that want people to be free thinkers and they exert their own free thoughts in the community, yet they would become united and unified. As the ayah says, وَأَنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُونَ The ultimate dream of Quran is that the entire humanity becomes unified and united in one nation. But does that mean that we, elevate, we eliminate our own thoughts for the sake of a single thinking? No. That's what Quran doesn't mean. What Quran means is that despite that I and you and everyone in the community have their own thoughts, their own philosophies, and their own world views, yet we live in harmony, peace, and a tranquility among ourselves. The Quran, when he talks about unity and unified nation, not at the expense of the free determination and free will and on the, our own autonomous way of thinking. In fact, Quran would respect our way of thinking. At the same time, he wants us to live in a society that is dominated by peace and its tranquility, not by hostility. Unfortunately, brothers and sisters, when you look at these two great teachings of Islam, you see the ones who have adopted those teachings are not the Muslims, are the non-Muslims. I am personally, personally very intrigued by the European Union. In Europe, 60 to 70 years ago, they had a very devastating war. In fact, there were two wars in the century. One was the First World War. The second was the Second World War. Both of them have caused more than 75 million people to die. They had wars among themselves. But eventually, they came to term to have peace and harmony among themselves. Today, 
despite the fact that each country in the European Union, they are autonomous and independent in policies and in thinking, but they are all having this harmonious relationship and peaceful relationship among themselves. And let's remember, they don't have a Holy Quran that admonish them and persuade them to be unified. This lesson should be applied to us as Muslims, that we have a Lord and we have a holy book and we have a holy prophet that all have emphasized on the harmonious nature of coexisting among ourselves while all have our independent thoughts. May one day we reach that level that non-Muslims have reached long time ago. We will come back. يا عزيزا لا يضام يا لطيفا لا يرام يا قيوما لا ينام يا دائما لا يفوت يا حيا لا يموت يا ملكا لا يزول يا باقيا لا يفنى يا عالما لا يجهل يا صمدا لا يطعم يا قويا لا يضعف سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب اللهم إني أسألك باسمك يا أحد يا واحد يا شاهد يا ماجد يا حامد يا راشد يا باعث يا وارث يا ضار يا نافع سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب يا أعظم من كل عظيم يا أكرم من كل كريم يا أرحم من كل رحيم يا أعلم من كل عليم يا أحكم من كل حكيم يا أقدم من كل قديم يا أكبر من كل كبير يا ألطف من كل لطيف يا أجل من كل جليل يا عز من كل عزيز سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب Welcome back with the great dua of Jushan Al-Kabir. Tonight, we will cover segments number 31, 32, and 33. Segment number three, the theme of the segment is to cleanse self from 
imperfection where it says ya azizan la yudham ya latifan la yuram ya qayyuman la yanam ya daiman la yafut ya hayyan la yamut ya malikan la yazul ya baqiyan la yafna ya aliman la yajhal ya samadan la yat'am la yut'am ya qawiyan la yadhaf o oh, the powerful who is never overpowered benign who is invisible self subsistent subsistent who never sleeps eternal who never perishes ever living who never dies monarch whose rule is endless eternal who is imperishable omniscient who never forgets independent who needs no sustenance mighty who never weakens the attributes of the almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the scholars divide monotheism tawhid in multiple segments in multiple compartments one of them is called tawhid al-sifat the monotheism of attributes we have the three kinds of attributes the first kind that cannot be attributed to almighty allah it's only attributed to us for example the weak the deceased al mayyit al dhaif these attributes never can be applied to the almighty second kind of attributes are the one that both men and god will share of course there is a huge difference between the two yet the vocabulary the terminology allows for common usage between the almighty and between human being for example kareem jawad generous magnanimous these are attributes that can be applied to both of course the generosity of the almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is totally different from the generosity of his servants there is no question yet for the sake of the ease the vocabulary is applied to both and then there only certain attributes that applied to the almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exclusively al khaliq al mutakabbir al mumit these are the pride the creator these are attributes that only applied are applied to the almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this segment we will recite some of those kinds of attributes the first one it says ya azizan la yudham an independent a powerful that cannot be oppressed that cannot be overcome as the translation translation says o oh, powerful who is never over power some of the arrogant yet ignorant rulers think that they have their own way of saying that they can do whatever they wish and god would allow them where the almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it says in one of his attribute it says that he would make people do what they want he is patient with them but he would not forget what they do yumhil wa la yuhmil he would not leave them he would not abandon them eventually at certain point he will take them forcefully in recent history we have seen that we have seen with certain despots whether in iraq or in libya or in egypt or in the future for example with those monarchs ruthless monarchs who challenge the magnificence of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala god will give them some room but would never forget about them eventually they are 
overpowered by him. The same way that God has done to Al Fir'aun, where it says, وَلَقَدْ جَاءَ آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ النُّذُرَ We have warned them. كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا كُلِّهَا But they rejected all our warnings. فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ أَخْذَ عَزِيزٍ مُقْتَدِرٍ We forcefully took them away. We obliterated them. In another ayah, the Almighty says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ إِنَّمَا يُؤَخِّرُهُمْ لِيَوْمٍ لَا تَشْخَصُ إِنَّمَا يُؤَخِّرُهُمْ لِيَوْمٍ تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ Do not ever think that God is oblivious about what the oppressors are doing, what kind of crimes and sins they are committing. God is never oblivious. God knows what they do. God has not forsaken them. He leaves them toward the end, toward the day of judgment. This life is not an eternal one and is not the final one. Maybe the oppressor get away with his own bad behavior. But in the hereafter, in the day of judgment, they are hunted by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it says, Ya azizan la yudam. The second word, it says the second phrase, Ya Latifan La Yuram. The Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so resilient that cannot be penetrated, meaning the essence of God cannot be penetrated and found and realized. No one can claim that God is known to him. Even the infallible. Even the greater prophet of Islam is oblivious about the true nature and the true essence of the, of the, of the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is impenetrable to the scope of understanding of entire human being. It is beyond our scope of knowledge and experience. Ya Latifan la yuram. In fact, the Almighty Allah, the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, تَفَكَّرُوا فِي خَلْقِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَفَكَّرُوا فِي اللَّهِ فَتَهْلَكُمْ When you want to think about the Lord, do not think about the essence of God, the nature of God, because you will be in a swagger. You will be at loss. Rather, think in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the traces of Allah. You see, in previous night, we discussed this point that whenever God mentions him, he doesn't bring the majestic name of God. He says, Billah. Always says, Bismillah, on the name of God. Using a means toward him because his true essence and a true nature is beyond our scope of comprehension. In another a statement by Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam he says iyyakum wa tafakkuru fi Allah fa inna at-tafakkuru fi Allah la yazidu illa tihan inna Allah azza wa jal la tudrikhu al-absar wa la yusafu bimiqdar be careful not to discuss the essence of Allah the essence of our god it cannot be imagined and cannot be reached by, by our eyes nor by any description. This is how <clears throat> our infallibles, our leaders have taught us when we discuss the subject of the Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there is an important question. If we are discouraged if from discussing the nature and a sense of God, then what does it mean, again, by the Imams themselves, when they say, Kamaluddini ma'rifatu, awwaluddini ma'rifatu. The perfection of your religion is that you become aware of it, that you know the Almighty God. What does it mean if we are discouraged to think about and discuss the essence of God, 
But on the other hand, we are encouraged and admonished to know, to know more about God. How do we reconcile between those two apparently contradicting statements? In fact, the Imams want us to realize and appreciate the Almighty God, not through the discussion of His essence, rather through the discussion of His creation, of His creatures. The, the, the ayah says, الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Those people who remember God, who are always thinking of God, but in what way? وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ They think about the creation of God. رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَكَ فَقْنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ If you want to get close to Allah by knowing Him, study the creation of God. One important subject is self, where the hadith says, مَنْ عَرَفَ نَفْسَهُ فَقَدْ عَرَفَ رَبَّهُ Whoever knows about himself will know about his Lord, will know, will come to realize the importance and significance of his Lord. This is segment 31. Segment 32, it is eliminating imperfection. I would recite only the translation where it says, O oh Allah, verily I beseech thee in thy name, unique, O one, O present, O praiser, exalted, guide, resurrector, higher, harmful to the unjust, beneficial to the just. These are, again, another set of attributes. Ya Allah, Ya Wahidu, Ya Ahad. He is one, but indivisible. Cannot have any physical attributes. We cannot attribute physical features to the Almighty. God, although stated in the, in the Holy Quran, God's hand, but God is exalted. He doesn't have a hand. He doesn't have any physical features that we have. Why? Because the clear statement in the Holy Quran says, There is nothing resembling him. Unfortunately, when you read some Islamic rit literatures, by some Muslims who do not follow the school of Ahlul Bayt. For example, they narrate by the Prophet, and this is stated in the books of Ahmed ibn Taymiyyah, the ideologue for Wahhabism and Salafism, where it says, رَأَيْتُ رَبِّي فِي الْمَنَامِ فِي صُورَةِ شَابٍ مُوَفَّرْ فِي خَضْرٍ فِي خَضْرٍ عَلَيْهِ نَعْلَانِ مِنْ ذَهَبْ He describing that the Prophet, peace be upon him, has dreamed his Lord, seeing God similar to a young man with no beard and wearing gold. These unfortunate statements written in the Islamic books where they prescribe and ascribe features to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we are cautiously admonished against. The third and last segment, segment number 33, is to challenge the rulers. Again, it goes this way for the translation. The grandest of all the grand, most magnanimous of all magnanimous, most merciful of all merciful, most knowledgeable of all knowers, most wise of all the wise, most ancient, of all ancient, most great of all the great, most benign of all the benign, most magnificent of all the magnificent, most mighty of all the mighty. The words, Ya Akrama min kulli kareem. The Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most generous, more generous than anything that anyone that comes to your mind. He sends his subsistence and nutrition to every living thing. There is no thing in this universe 
that he is not a recipient of God's generosity and mercy. In one beautiful verse, the Almighty says, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقَهَا You do not see any moving creature if God does not send nourishment and subsistence to وَيَعْلَمُ مُسْتَقَرُّهَا وَمُسْتَوْدُعَهُ كُلٌّ فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is treating us with generosity, with mercy, with mercy and with benevolence. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to be the recipient of the mercy and benevolence of the Almighty. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Generosity is the protector of honor. Forbearance is the bridle of the fool. Forgiveness is the levy of success. Disregard is the punishment of him who betrays. And consultation is the chief way of guidance. He who is content with his own opinion faces danger. Endurance braves calamities, while impatience is a helper of the hardships of the world. The best contentment is to give up desires. Many a slavish mind is subservient to overpowering longings. Capability helps preservation of experience. Love means well-utilized relationship. Do not trust one who is grieved.